<laughs> Not an apt solution, no help. Uh, good evening, I'm Jonathan Shaw, and welcome to the 22nd annual awarding of the Saber of Boldness. The award is presented by the editors of the journal Gottesdienst, the Journal of the Lutheran Liturgy, and I would like to simply uh, introduce the editors that are here at this time and also note what department they are the editor of. And I'll go down. Uh, Reverend Benjamin Ball, conferences. You may have left. You may have left, okay. Along with the other people. No, okay. Um, Reverend Mark Brayton, taking pains. Uh, Reverend Jason Broughton, Augustine's Online. Reverend Carl Fabritius, Musing on the Mysteries. Reverend David, David Peterson, Commentary on the War. And uh, not present here this evening, also uh, Reverend Larry Bean, Sermons, Reverend Heath Curtis, uh, God of Saints Online, Reverend Rick Steckwish, God of Saints Online, Reverend Aaron Cook, are you here? Good. Uh, Emeritus of Sermons. And, uh, and I am Jonathan Shaw, Saber of Boldness, on that column. And I'm glad you're here. Uh, the Saber, which you see before you, hangs on a plaque the size of a door. And it hangs in Sussex, Wisconsin. And the inscription beneath the Saber reads as follows. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity on behalf of the Holy Church of Christ, while engaged in the confession of his pure gospel in the face of hostile forces and at the greatest personal risk. And I must note at the outset that my comments are my own <clears throat> and do not necessarily represent the official position of the United States Army, the Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. <clears throat> and that you can take to the bank. Uh, I want to briefly note uh, how a soldier serving at the pointy end of the spear uh, helps us understand what it means to be a Christian who bears the savor of boldness. Now, for the last 15 plus years, uh, the United States has been involved in a war, not against Islam, but against radical traditionalist Muslims waging militant jihad against the West. And some of your sons and daughters and other relatives have been engaged in that war in our, in our behalf and for our defense, and I thank you for that. Um, the way we wage war is according to the uh, just war tradition. It's not peace at all costs pacifism. Neither is it might makes right, which is real, realism or real politic. But it's where the state turns to the military to achieve a better, more just peace. But the warrior at the pointy end of the spear, the one engaged in combat, still must bear the human cost. It's all well and good that the state has just war rules for how to decide to go to war. Thank you, God. And it's all well and good that the military has rules of engagement on how they should fight. All very good. But uh, those do not help the individual soldier in the deepest sense uh, when he must justify, as he stands before God, how it is that he could do violence to another human being. In this way, he's caught in as the minister of justice, having to bear in his body the wounds which it necessitates. We call that moral injury which the Department of Defense does not yet recognize, but it's real, it's the signature mark of the last 15 years in the war. And um, it helps us understand a little bit about the saber of boldness. Because uh, Christians don't take a literal spear, but we have the saber, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, which, with which we bring to bear, and Christians bring to bear the eternal will of the Father by way of an everlasting word, the promises of the gospel, 
and the declaration of righteousness and forgiveness by the bloody deeds and redemptive words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in bringing the pointy tip of the spear, this sword, which cuts deep in the spirit to bring true life, it simultaneously pokes in the eye of the devil of the world and of all sinful flesh, including our own. So there is great pathos uh, as that saber of salvation, the saving word of God is brought and it stirs the devil and it stirs wrath and the one who bears it must bear the marks in his body um, but we are here to give thanks for that to remember it uh, for in such suffering we see figured for us a cruciform figure of the one who bore all and did all for us and for our salvation. And so it is not out of the sense of triumphalism that we gather, but a sense of honor and thankfulness. Dr. Ecker. Thank you, Chaplain. I'd like to say briefly a few words about Goddess Deans itself, in this vast organization. Um, we don't even know how many of us there are. <laughs> I say that because this is the 25th year of Godestines. In fact, the December or the Christmas 2017 issue will be our 100th issue. So I welcome your comments and letters to the editor this year in particular. If you have something you want to say, send it in. Um, that's not going to be a feature of this year's issues. And then you're part of our vast organization. As you all know, America will have a new president tomorrow. Part of the preparation for his inauguration has been his attendance just today at the wreath-laying ceremony at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington Cemetery. It is part of the fabric of human existence that we understand the importance of honor, and this is certainly a prominent feature of our regard for individuals serving and sacrificing in our nation's military. It is also, as is meet and right, a prominent feature of our faith. We are in duty bound to give honor to those whose faith we find honorable. As St. Paul also says, render therefore to all their dues, honor to whom honor is due. My compatriot, Chaplain Shaw, likes to call our little Saber Award ceremony the most important of its kind in the world. And while I leave the judgment on that matter to you, what I will offer is this. It is certainly more important than the awards ceremony put on by self-congratulating Hollywood elites like Meryl Streep most recently at the Golden Globe Awards. And it's also more important, I would dare offer, than the Medal of Freedom Award, with which Vice President Biden was surprised just the other day. As important as such an award might be, we know that this is all, that is all kingdom of the left hand stuff, and as such, not really as momentous as the recognition given to people of faith for their faith and courage. I guess there are very few awards given, like this one, actually. The Seminary's Miles Christi Award comes to mind, but that's a little bit different, too. Our award was conceived in a bit of jest some 23 years ago, as most of you may know. But very quickly we realized the serious need for us to recognize the valor, the courage, the humility, the honor, and the faith of various people of God who do not flinch when threatened with various reasons not to do their Christian duty. Each year we are given a number of suggested nominees for this award. Sometimes suggestions are declined, sometimes they are tabled, and sometimes they are reconsidered. This year, we have arrived at two nominees. First is Judge Ruth Neely of Pinedale, Wyoming. Judge Neely, small town, Missouri Synod Lutheran, he had a small bench, has been recommended for removal from her bench by the Wyoming Ethics Commission simply for saying in a hypothetical question she would not be able to do marriage ceremonies for gay couples, even though she would offer to find someone who would do them. In this case, 
is headed for the state Supreme Court. Her story and her courage has been in the national news. Second is Reverend Dr. Gottfried Martins of Berlin, Germany, who is a nominee for the second straight year. He had been pastor of St. Mary's Lutheran Church in Berlin for many years, a church which has seen hundreds of refugees come in, Muslims seeking the truth and finding it under his preaching and catechesis, being baptized and brought into his congregation. His success among the immigrants has put his name on the, in the German news and has put him personally at risk due to the violence that so easily attaches itself to Muslim extremists who do not take kindly to losing nearly a thousand converts to Christianity. Dr. Martins, incidentally, has recently become the pastor now of Trinity Lutheran Church in Berlin Steglitz, which is almost entirely comprised of immigrants who have converted to the Lutheran faith. But the German government has recently begun to deny en masse the refugee claims of many of these converts, following what Dr. Martins is called is calling deeply flawed refugee hearings. The problem, Dr. Martins says, is that many of those hearing the cases are manifestly clueless about the situations of Christians in Iran and Afghanistan. And worse yet, they are utterly clueless concerning questions relating to the Christian faith. But all of this does not prevent them from assuming the role of self-appointed self experts whose questions unmask the supposedly deceitful Iranian asylum applicants one after another, even those whose hearing uh, though, when those hearing the cases don't know the difference between the Apostles' Creed and the Our Father. The challenges come after a year of other difficulties, as converts to Christianity have faced increasing persecution from Muslim refugees angry at their conversions from Islam. Congregational members and candidates for baptism are being attacked, sometimes beaten and threatened with death, both in Germany and from their homeland, to which deportation is threatened. The refugees are instructed in the Christian faith prior to baptism or excluded if a genuine conversion is not evident. Currently, baptisms at his church are between 30 and 40 a month. After deliberating, what the editors decided to do this year is something a little different than we've done in the past. We are offering the savor of boldness for 2017 to Reverend Dr. Martins and his congregation, Trinity in Berlin, Steglitz. He is not here, but we've asked Reverend Wil Wilhelm Torgerson to stand in for him to receive the award on his behalf. Pastor Torgerson. Dear brothers, um, I think you have chosen well. Uh, I just came back from Berlin recently. I attended Dr. Martin's service on January 1st, and I preached there for the English language epiphany service on Saturday the 7th. In both cases, of course, the place was packed and one of the most moving experiences, certainly in my 46 years of ministry, has been that whenever the sermon is finished, either Dr. Martens, with his fantastic way of preaching in German language, rather colloquial, by the way, and then everybody gets up, and as a man, confesses the Apostles' Creed in Farsi. And it's certainly one of the most moving things that I have ever experienced in a service, particularly when you see that most of these uh, confessors of Christ have only recently, very deliberately, 
rejected not only the Muslim faith, by the way, at their own suggestion, they add not only that they re reject Satan and all his works, but also have asked that they specifically confess that they reject the Muslim faith and its prophet. And these are young men who are looking for a new future. Most of them, or at least many of them, are in dire straits, not only economically and financially, but even more so under attack by some segments of German society, now under particular pressure by the commissioners that are in charge of asking uh, information about their transfer or conversion to the Christian faith and I have finally gotten to know some young men of Persian ancestry, in fact they are Persians um, who can tell you a lot about why they rejoice despite the danger that that entails in having become a Christian, something that we can learn, that we have been Christians most of, most of our lives, to how people who have come newly to the faith experience a deep sense of joy and are willing to take upon themselves the attendant <coughs> dangers that are connected with that kind of conversion. I thank you for your consideration. I will try to write Gottfried an email this evening, if I may, and I still speak. He doesn't even know he was nominated. I, I see. <laughs> He'll be very moved, and particularly his congregation. Um, it, it, it was a congregation, by the way, I was for some time. Some of you may know this, probes for East Germany, so I had some supervisory capacity to fill. And uh, the congregation was dying. Trinity, the first uh, congregation of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod to be rebuilt in Berlin after World War II, was dying. 20 members at the end. It now has about 1,100 members, of which 90% are Persians, with some Germans, some Americans, being in the Missouri Synod, obviously there are some Preuss members over there. <laughs> <laughs> They're apparently all over the place. <laughs> and uh, as I said, it's a moving experience when you see Dr. Martin has now begun himself to speak Farsi, and in the middle of the service he can start talking when he considers it necessary. I thank you very much. I have one request to make, or actually two requests, please. The most important thing that you can do for him is pray for him and his ministry. The only problem that I've always seen in Gottfried's ministry is he apparently doesn't, uh, has never looked at his watch. Uh, usually he goes to bed at two o'clock and then if you phone him at six, he's up. And, uh, sometimes that takes a toll on his health, please pray for him and the way he does his ministry. And the other thing is if I can kind of put that flea into your ear, we're certainly going to consider that in the faculty at St. Catherine's, we are going to write a letter of protest to the German ambassador in Ottawa and asking that uh, the German government take steps to see that the hearings to which these young men are subjected are conducted in a fair and equitable manner, something that is really bad in Berlin right away. Uh, it's not that bad all over the place, I'll, I'll say that in gratitude, but if you are so inclined, maybe it's good that the, the German government become aware that this has become a matter of consideration all over the world. Thank you very much.
Well, this is the Profit Savers Appellate Pen. Some of our former uh, current uh, people who have formerly received the award, you will see wearing these Profit Saver pins. It goes on your lapels. SB Saver Goods. One saver for the bearer, the other one for all the ones the bearer represents, which is all the ones. Many of them we don't know. Thank you very so much. So we will. I will Leave it in the box, and if you would pass that on, I would appreciate it very much. Yes. And, and finally, I would ask all those, uh, the editors of the Journal of Augustines, we're going to begin with our Supreme Allied editor, <laughs> and also all the former Sabre uh, awardees, and all those who have been nominated for the Sabre in the past, to come forward for a photo. Thank you very much. Uh, any, uh, okay. And some of the uh, editors? Yeah. Uh, I'll get up at 6.30 here. So. Hey, Steve. Steve. I'll move for you. You got the good shot. Okay. We'll get, this. We'll get a couple photos here. Get in here. Carl, don't hide. Keep you, know, you know what Jesus said when he said that? Did he say that? Did he say that? Did he say that? Yes. Are we, are we just passing it up? Yes. All right, look, look here, please. Okay. One. Okay. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Okay, I've got it. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks.